So what we see manifested in a lot of the public records is this idea that Rani Jindagorn was the one who instigated the war in 1845, the first anglo sikh war, to seek revenge for the, the murder of her brother, Jawahar Singh, by the Khalsa troops. It's kind of rubbish, to be quite honest. <laughs> What's going on everyone, it's Ramblings of a Seat. First of all, welcome to all the new viewers who have ended up on this video thanks to a quirk in the YouTube algorithm or by accident. Please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future uploads. Obviously then, a huge welcome back to all of those who have been supporting the channel for some time. I hope you enjoyed this video along with all the others you've seen so far. Today you and I are going to talk to Priya Atwal and find out about Priya's upbringing, education and discovery of the Sikh Empire, Priya's journey from dissertation to her book, we also then dive into the machinations of the Dogra brothers, the reality of the Lahore Darbar, and we take a look at who Rani Jindan really is. A quick request, again. 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 Before we get into it, please make sure to like, comment and subscribe. I've heard if you do all three, you get 108 years of good luck. Let me know in the comments if that works for you. So today I've got the pleasure to talk to Dr. Priya Atwal, a historian, author and broadcaster. She was awarded her PhD by the University of Oxford in 2017. Her academic research specializes in the history of monarchy, empire and cultural politics across Britain and South Asia. Priya's first book, Royals and Rebels, The Rise and Fall of the Sikh Empire, was published by Hearst and Oxford University Press in September 2020 to rave reviews. Um, in fact, I had the chance to review it I think on the day it was released by Amazon. Um, so if anyone wants to go and read the review, feel free. The link will be in the description. Now, with that introduction out of the way, I would like to say a quick thank you to our guest and welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. No, thank you so much. You've been someone that I've had on the list for quite a while. Um, I'm sure you can uh, attest to me pestering you and saying, when are you free? When are you free? <laughs> but no, no, I really, really do appreciate you making the time to to, to do this. Definitely so, have to be here. Sorry it's taken so long. No, no, not a problem. Not a problem. I guess, what what do they say? It's, it's the, you keep the best till last. So I'm, I'm really not bothered. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Priya has obviously been someone I've wanted to host on the podcast since her book was published. So I'm quite excited, obviously, to get to grips with it and talk about it in, in kind of greater depth. But before we do that, like we do with all our guests, we kind of like to get to know a little bit more about them. I guess in a nutshell, who is Priya Atwal? Oh, well, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> I, I am Priya Atwal and I'm a historian. <laughs> But I didn't expect to be a historian, to be quite honest. Um, well, why do you want me to start? We, this could get really long and boring quite fast. Um, <laughs> Wherever you feel I, comfortable with, I, I don't mind. Whatever you think is the most relevant point to start with. Well, I, I mean, I talk about the story a little bit behind the book, uh, you know, uh, in, in the book, in the acknowledgements. Um, I grew up in Buckinghamshire, in High Wycombe, uh, in quite a white area. <laughs> there was only about three... See kids in my in my high school, one wow. of whom was my cousin. I had no clue that there was a Sikh empire. I didn't know who Maharaja Ranjit Singh was. I didn't know who Rani Jinda was, Dalip Singh, any of these people, until I went to university. I studied at Oxford. I did all my studies there, which was amazing. But it was in my first year of uni, one of my friends who was in the year above me at Sikh Sok sort of said to me, and I'd, I'd been I'd been you know encouraged to go to Sikh Sok by the small star socials at the very beginning <laughs> as everyone is right yeah. and uh I made loads of friends in the first term everyone was so lovely and it was like a home away from home you know being in somewhere like Oxford and actually that friend Rupi um was introduced to me by another friend at school they were again distantly related and you know when I got my Oxford offer when I was in in my last year of sixth form I got it and my family, everyone was so happy. I was so happy, I couldn't believe it. But I was really nervous. I was like, is there going to be anyone like me there? You know, are there going to be other Sikh Punjabi people? Because I'd already experienced this at school and it, it wasn't great. And all I knew was it's going to be really posh, really clever people and I wasn't going to fit in, you know? <laughs> and so my friend of Jaw invite, in, introduced me to her distant relation, Rupinda Rupi. And when I got to Sikh Sok, Rupi was like a big, welcoming, northern last, you know, really beautiful, skinny little thing, but big hugs and that kind of stuff. And uh, she um, got me involved in the Sikh Sok and I was loving my degree. I definitely wanted to study some Indian history at some point. But it was a shock to the system when I went to the Sikh Sok talk in my second term. And I must have been only about 18, 19 at the time. 
and they were talking about the Sikh Raj and it was a book launch for Badwan Singh's book, basically. It wasn't, he didn't come and speak himself with Jyoti Rai, but uh, there were there was a group, Anglo Sikh Heritage Trail, who were promoting this book. And um, they were talking and they were telling about the story, the rise and fall, and they mentioned about Rani Jim's war at the end and how she fended off the British. And, and mm. I was like, whoa, 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 who is this person, you know? And Rupi had said to me beforehand, you've got to ask the question at the end because nobody asks questions and it's always awkward when a speaker comes from somewhere else and no one asks a question. <laughs> and she goes, you're the only history student that we've got, so you better say something. And I was like, the pressure was on, right? <laughs> but it didn't matter by that point because I was like, oh, whoa, like who, who are these people? What is, how did I not know? And so I just could have kept asking questions all night. Um, but that was my spark really to study this history and to I was just desperate to know more and it, it just literally blew my mind that you know I knew about all these other British kings and queens but I had no idea this existed you know there's a massive gap in my knowledge and uh, that planted the seed to write an undergraduate dissertation on Rani Jinsbord and then I wanted to write a book about her and then I went and worked in advertising for a bit and didn't <laughs> like it and realized <laughs> no I should definitely go back to uni and do a PhD and then the rest, as they say, is history. Is history. It, yeah, <laughs> literally, quite literally. That is brilliant. I find it interesting. And I'm actually quite um, pleased to hear that your Sikh sock was beneficial in your time at university. Because unfortunately, the Sikh society lectures that I attended when I was at university made me kind of embarrassed because there was a lack of depth and kind of more than what you would get at your Punjabi school when you're kind of like, Ten or whatever. On the flip side, though, I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So, like, what was your understanding of Sikh history, quote unquote? Because that could mean a lot of things. But I guess in particular to to, to uh, like the Sikh Empire and kind of what I guess a lot of people look at in mainstream, like kind of popular history, is the golden age or one of the golden ages of of the Sikh community, however you want to describe that. But what was your understanding then before even getting to university? Like, did you literally know nothing? Oh literally wow. No clue literally no clue that's what i'm saying that's how bad it was and as a history student as well it was all basically i'm telling you <laughs> <Literally. laughs> no then... i knew there were 10 gurus i knew that we are punjabi and you know i knew i knew the absolute basics right i mean i say that we've got basics of sikhi now and they actually teach people things but i <laughs> i just do not i just need the literal basics i knew there were muggles that oppressed us these kind of things i had a very rudimentary very biased understanding of Sikh history, right? Yeah. And I knew what happened in 1947 very vaguely. Yeah. But I did not know any that this this ex, there was a kingdom in between all of that. You know. What, what was your first impression? Because I because I because what I'm trying to kind of put together is that someone who studied history at Oxford University would like the determination, the the drive, the passion, everything that goes into someone making it into that type of establishment is next to none like as in it's 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 an incredible achievement and it obviously goes to reflect also your level of kind of knowledge and everything that goes with that so when you were first introduced to these characters what was the type of reaction like what was what was your initial response well i was sat in the back of the uh, seminar room you know with my friend uh, sitting next to me her name's <laughs> ushma she was from bombay so she, I just dragged her with me to say, just, you know, come, just come you know, yeah. come and listen. Yeah, there's food as well. <laughs> we'd, we'd always go for food afterwards, Pizza Hut, Nando, something. You know, it was a social thing. It was very relaxed. Um, and I was sat at the back and, I mean, I, I still have a very vivid memory of just, you know, I can't remember the whole content of the talk, but just, you know, kind of slowly, slowly relaxing and just being gripped by what I was hearing and the images on the screen, the slideshow, and then... It, everything was just like hang on so there was this maharaja and then you know and then it all collapses and wait so then there's a woman and there's a kid on the throne and then they're fighting against the british i mean i think the other thing is i'm big i'm especially as a teenager i was a big bollywood movie fan right so i'd grown up on a bollywood diet of history too you know i'd watch gudden I'd watch Jordan Akbar, I'd watch Nagan or Raljan. So these kind of movies had shaped this very romantic sense of our history, right? But again, yeah. it's not Punjabi history, is it really? No, no. Think about it. So I, I went to university, I applied to Oxford with the view, and all the universities that I applied for in the, in the UK, for anyone listening, five UCAS you know, options you have, uh, every single one of them, I knew going in that I wanted to study 
Indian history. I'd not had the opportunity at school. My appetite had been wet from studying, watching all these movies. And I knew I wanted to do that kind of thing, gender history and Indian history. So I only applied to universities at undergrad level that were offering an option on the course list. So that narrowed it down. Obviously, wasn't expecting to get into Oxford, but you'd be surprised. Well, you all know what a Punjabi mum behind you can push you to do. <laughs> and it was, you know, that encouragement from my parents, from my teachers that gave me that sense of at least go for it, at least give it a go, right? Uh, whether you get in or not is a different story. Um, but it was that, you know, that community event, essentially, that, that showed me something of our history in a much more personal way. And then from there, I just immediately went, they, they mentioned at the end, these guys giving a talk, they said, we need volunteers to do research, yeah. um, to find out more about this history. We're gonna do some internships at the British Library in the summer holidays. And I oh, was like, wow. yes, please, thank yeah. you very much. Let's do it, I'll sign me up. That's and amazing. that was it then. That I had the opportunity amazing. to work in the archives for the first time. And that is what I went to research. That is absolutely amazing. I am kind of blown away and also slightly jealous because I wish I had that type of opportunity because it is literally a dream. That is that is brilliant. Just then explain kind of from your dissertation to the book, what like what is the journey from kind of your initial dissertation to the book? Obviously, a lot happens. And how do you go about some of your research and kind of uncovering some of the material that you use, obviously, to then write the book? Uh, well, there's two, there's two questions there. There's the work question and there's the personal question. The journey to turn it into a book, uh, you know, incorporates both, obviously. Um, I mean, my dissertation at undergrad level, I was, uh, how did I start with that? I think I was just, I was curiosity that drove it. You know, I'd spent that, that one summer at the end of my first year of uni doing some research stuff for this organization. Uh, based on stuff that they were interested in but they said if you find something interesting yourself just run with it it's totally fine we're happy to support you and then going into my second year of uni my history tutor at uh, Oriel College now infamous for not taking down the Cecil Rhodes statue um, you know he my actual history professor there uh, is a guy called Ian Forrest he was brilliant and he really encouraged all of us to follow our noses and follow our hearts with, with you know research leads but also what fascinates you and you know to then really go with with what you want to research basically so he when he heard that i wanted to do this thing on about a sea queen and this that, and the other he was like we've never had anything like this before go for it priya so they gave me funding to go do some archive work in london again um you know i mean it's little bits of money here and there make a difference you know when you're when you're a student especially not coming from a wealthy background or anything like that and so i had the opportunity to dive deep into the india office records in london and there's so much there, I'm honestly, it's endless. There's, especially the Dalit Singh family material and the Sikh Empire material. I still haven't finished reading it. And I've been researching this stuff for like over 11 years now, you know, there's so much there. And every time you reread it, you discover different connections and thought patterns, you know? Um, so the dissertation obviously I had to write for my third year exams, but it was a transformative experience. And um, I think after that, when I started presenting it, in different conferences and stuff like that then and and you know telling people about it, this is what i found family members you know at seek stop talks i carried on sharing it and what i realized is other people didn't know this much about that story you know and friends used to do oh you've become obsessed with rani jindabad now like you know this maharani fever that's come over you but it it caught me it caught my attention that people really wanted to know you know they don't have access to this stuff and i wasn't the only one who had been in that situation that I'd been in when I was a bit younger that didn't have a clue. So it stayed with me, you know, and I thought this is an incredible story. I discovered new stuff about the politics of the anglo Sikh wars, about the kind of behind the scenes deals that were going on with Maharaja Gulab Singh and other things, but also just taking a fresh take on Jindal and how she operated. I knew that I wanted to do something about her. And initially I thought a biography, um, but I shelved it for the time being because I was kind of broke. I did a master straight after that. And I needed to pay off my debts and that kind of stuff. Family, you know, we borrowed money to get, get me through that time. So then I was like, okay, I've had enough of studying for a little while. I'll do the book on the side. I'll go get a job. So I've got on a graduate scheme. But within six months, you know, I was being paid peanuts. I learned lots, but I just really didn't enjoy it. And my heart was back in 
academia really and a research and uh luckily my phd supervisor was had been working with me for my masters and he was very keen for me to come back and, and work on this stuff so that was it i went to do the phd and um with the phd is a whole other ball game you know i don't know if you if you've ever thought about doing a phd i don't know if that is ever a, an idea I've... to cross your mind when I left, so I just like you were saying earlier that when you left your degree, you went, you kind of ended up doing a job in, in, in advertising. So similarly, when I left my history degree, I didn't want to basically all of the kind of the career prospects that I had been told were like, you can become a teacher, a journalist. And I was like, that's really boring. Like, I don't want to do either of those. Like, I don't particularly want to be a teacher and I don't want to be a journalist either. Well, at that point, anyway. Um, and so I managed to basically do another degree which was probably the worst thing I, like I, I picked to do because it was probably the hardest thing I've done in my life but basically I did a uh, I did a degree in law for graduates so they combine everything into like two years and it is it's insane um yeah, but I've always yeah it's, it horrible, it's horrible it's painful oh so bad <laughs> and I've always like with yourself like Slightly different in that because I'd kind of grown up in a like Coventry, West Midlands is super, super rich in Sikh Punjabi culture. Oh, well, Sikh culture, because obviously you've got the Kenyans, you've got the Punjabis, you've got all it's such a mix in, in and around this area. So I kind of was always interested in Sikh history just from a like a similar with yourself in a personal aspect of like, all right, I just want to find out more. And I also want to find it out, A, for myself, but also from like sources like from the horse's mouth so to speak so i always wanted to do a phd but again finding the the people to fund it finding the right place to do it finding an actual topic that i'm willing to spend a decade or so of my life on um yes i would <laughs> absolutely love to, yeah years. yeah, yeah. You i would love if you're doing it for 10 years like so i would love to do one i definitely would love to do one looking back i think i should have decided i should have picked to do one kind of just straight after i graduated from a history degree because i feel like things are a little bit rusty since but um i would like i would absolutely love it if anyone listening to this podcast is has some type of connection to a university or a phd please let me know because like i genuinely would love it so hence why having this conversation with yourself and like learning about kind of your experience and what you had to do in order to get to, to, to where you are is interesting just on itself, but also from a personal level, it kind of gives me an insight into, okay, like, make, like it gives you a flavor. Yeah. It gives you a flavor of what it's, yeah. it's like. Oh, well, I don't want to scare you to be honest. <laughs> well, look, I think, I think we should all, I'm going to call a shout out to the listeners to say, please let's all crowdsource crowdfund Amma's PhD shall we and we can discuss we can have a separate podcast to discuss your thesis topic I'll do a little mini supervision with you how about that oh but, um, that would be a dream that would be a dream <laughs> well look, I mean for me it, it, you know all of these challenges that you questions that you raised were very much in in the forefront of my mind and there were challenges that I had to deal, deal with all the way through um I mean my supervisor was very supportive he said look I'd be more than happy to support your application um, you know, to come back to Oxford, that was Special Devji, who's written amazing stuff on uh, Muslim intellectual history and that kind of stuff. Not related to Sikh history at all, but just an absolute genius of a man and an incredibly helpful and smart supervisor. And so the relationship that you have with the supervisor is integral because they are the ones that are going to read your stuff day in, day out, help you through your agonizing three years of, or four years of, of study. And have to be interested in what you're doing. If they're not interested, then you're kind of screwed, to be quite honest, you know, because um, they're your first port of call for, for developing your project. So Faisal was, was great. He was on board. I was very happy to be going back to Oxford, but funding was a big, big question. I didn't have any funding. And when you apply to a UK university, um, normally you will be automatically considered for any scholarship that they offer. But you can also be you also tick a box to say that you will be um, willing to be considered for national funding, whether it's science stream, social sciences or humanities. Um, so I would have been funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is a government body. But I didn't get the funding in my first year. Tried again the second year, didn't get it again. And that's where I had a crunch moment, essentially, because the first year I'd been able to fund by myself kind of thing because I've been working for a year so I had the funds to get myself through but the, uh, the gamble had been that I'll get hopefully some money for the second year and then thereafter 
It just so happened that my younger brother was also doing that GDL course that you just mentioned that you did. And he got a job offer for a trainee contract for the, for the role that he was going into after the, the degree, but not they, the company said at the last minute that they couldn't fund his training programs, right? His, his GDL and then the LPC, the, the practitioner stuff. So we were both stuck, right? This was, oh, when was it? About 2014, 2015, I think. And I nearly abandoned it. I nearly abandoned the PhD at that point because we were terrified as a family. How are we going to afford all these fees? You know, we didn't have money for this. Um, but luckily, some family members, my kind of adopted nun and auntie, stepped in and said, we'll lend you guys some money. I managed to get a part-time job in the admissions team uh, admissions and outreach team in the undergraduate admissions at Oxford so I worked there part-time and it was a permanent job two days a week and my college at Oxford Lady Margaret Hall by that point shelled out some money this as a hardship fund uh, so between all of that and my mum and dad working really really hard we managed to cobble together the money essentially and my brother had to take the loan out so oh it was really tough you know and I think it bred for a little while a bit of an imposter syndrome. But am I doing even the right thing? Uh, am I wasting everyone's money? Or because you know it was it was at that time as well the research that I was doing on sort of British and Indian royal relations and the Sikh Empire at the heart of that was considered a niche topic of interest. It wasn't what everybody else, the kind of stuff everyone else was researching. So you know it was a bit sketchy at <laughs> that time. But we powered through as a family. We powered through. It was a really tough time. Um, and then we had to pay off money afterwards. But that dream was there all along to turn this into a book. And every day I was discovering all sorts of new stuff. Um, so I will say it to anyone that's listening, you know, it's a really tough environment for, for especially for, um, you know, not very wealthy, you know, your average black Asian minority families in this country that haven't say got a massive connection with higher education in this, in this country. It's hard work, it's hard to get in, it's hard to get the funding, it's hard to get your plans together. It's not to say that you shouldn't do it though. Um, and that I think we as a community need to get better at supporting our, our people. And it doesn't matter if you're a youngster or if you're a bit older in life and you wanna to return to uni as a mature student, it should be okay to do it whenever you wanna do it, right? We should have support available to do that. It should come from the government, it should come from institutions, but it should also come from, from our community as much as possible. Because if we want that knowledge, you know, within our within our ranks, right? We need to find a way to support it. And and what was amazing to me as I was studying every day was Maharaja Ranjit Singh Sarbad is building this stuff day in day out in 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 their activities, right? In their libraries, in their artists, in their courtly conversations. So I was like, we can't even say that we're an Anubhada community. That's such a stereotype that we have about ourselves. There's so much history there, so much proof of the wealth of our knowledge. We need to bring that culture back. Yes, yes, definitely. I don't disagree with you whatsoever. I think I'm also really glad that you did pull through and everything worked out and you did publish the book because I think I, I think I messaged you like soon after reading it, which is I haven't come across a book written by someone who is circa close to my age about anything related to Sikh, just full stop. Um, and then yet to see someone like yourself of a very similar age, similar kind of background and understanding of kind of being Sikh, but being British and then within all of that and kind of finding yourself, but then also the depth at, at which that you deal with the topic at hand, I, like I absolutely loved it. So I just wanted to find out a bit more, like you'd mentioned Gulab Singh's was up to basically up to no good in the background. Could you just expand a little bit on that and, and like kind of what was what was he doing? Who was he dealing with? Kind of what was the result of it? Well, we've gone quite deep into this quite quickly then. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so this some of this stuff was first uncovered by uh, Bala Sathinder Singh's book on the Jumble Fox or something like that. I think the title was. And it's quite an old book, but I was able to take it a little bit further with um, with stuff that I uncovered with my earlier research. Essentially, for those that are listening that might not know who these people were that we're talking about, um, you have Maharaja Ranjit Singh's family, who were the ruling dynasty of Punjab from the, the late 18th century onwards up until 1849. But then 
you know, amongst Punjabi elites, there were various Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, various different noble families that were new or were recently promoted, as well as European generals and, and all sorts of people. A foremost among them that had risen rapidly through the ranks under Ranjit Singh's rulership were the Dobra clan. And there were three brothers, Raja Dhyan Singh, Sujit Singh, Gulab Singh. And Dhyan Singh was essentially Maharaja Ranjit Singh's prime minister or Vakil through much of his reign. All three brothers were incredibly smart, incredibly charming, you know, and very good at their military activity as well. And that was how really through the military side of things that they'd risen through the ranks. They hailed from the sort of Jammu Kashmir part of this kingdom, which had, was taken over by Ranjit Singh in the course of his reign. And uh, they came really from quite humble origins and rapidly got through. And they were very ambitious. And the kind of relationship between their family and the ruling family is deeply controversial in that there's lots of kind of, uh, well, question marks, shall we say, within the history <laughs> about whether Dhyan Singh in particular really wanted to take over from Maharaja Ranjit Singh's family after the Maharaja died in 1839, and that potentially he was gunning for his son, his own son, Raja Hira Singh, who was definitely a favourite of Maharaja Ranjit Singh's, to become in the future a Maharaja, or essentially the most powerful guy at Lahore. And this didn't come to pass. Um, in all of the power struggles that take place in Lahore in the 1840s after Ranjit Singh's death, Dhyan Singh is killed, Shadir Singh is killed, Hira Singh is killed, all at various, all in the power struggles that take place. Gulab Singh's son is also killed, and he is the last one standing of that family. And he is an incredibly bitter, angry man at that point, but still very power hungry. So the, the family's kind of attempt to control Lahore fails miserably. But what he takes away as a consolation prize, in a way, is, is my understanding anyway, is that he wants to take control of Jammu and Kashmir and make it his own state, right? Cut his losses from Lahore. And uh, it's that that he manoeuvres to do in the 1840s, in the middle of the 1840s. He tries to stay away as much as possible from Rani Jinpour's government's control, the army's control. And what I found in the British Library was, although he was expected to be a courtier, a minister of the Lahore Darbar, and a, as well as a general of the, of the broader caste army, he really starts to chart an independent policy in, by, by sort of 1843 to 45. And Sikh troops are deployed multiple times to try and rein him in, to make him pay his taxes on time. And he doesn't want to do it, right? But he does this whole show of coming and mafia munging and, you know, with ha hands folded, sorry, I've, I've made a mistake. A bit like Boris Johnson, to be quite honest. I didn't know what I was doing. And then, uh, and then he pays them off, he bribes off the soldiers and sends them back. There's a whole bribery and corruption thing that goes on. And this is all documented in these secret enclosures to um, British government letters that move back and forth from Shimla, Dili, Punjab, and then back to London. So the main letters are have one story, but the intelligence files that were sent as enclosures with the letters tell a different story in much more detail. And it's when you read these things side by side that you really see how these historical narratives over time leave things out or gloss things over or overemphasize certain things, right? So what we see manifested in a lot of the public records is this idea that Rani Jindagod was the one who instigated the war in 1845, the first Anglo-Sikh war, to avenge Sikh revenge for the, the murder of her brother, Jawahar Singh, by the Khalsa troops. It's kind of rubbish, to be quite honest, <laughs> because if, if you look at um, the primary sources for that period and you look at the range of them, if you look at the letters, for example, that were published in the Punjab Blue Books, which were the, the kind of official government re record or narrative that was published in Parliament immediately after the first Anglo-Sikh war to justify and explain what happened. In those letters, you will see the Governor General, Henry Harding, saying that the Maharani has you know, done this, that she's angry and she's willing to chuck the, the troops across the river in a kind of do or die mission. If they die, she'll be happy because she's got a bottle of but if they win, then great, they can loot British territories and give her some space and then bring back that, that bounty, essentially. But what he misses out is the private letters that he wrote to Raja Gulab Singh and back and forth, right? Uh, where Raja Gulab Singh is also bribing other government ministers and soldiers to put the Maharani in a corner 
essentially. But she has no control over the army. He's posing as a loyal minister to her, but underhandedly bribing her soldiers and cutting a deal with Harding to say, if a war happens, this is, this is how the troops are gonna move. This is how things are gonna go down. These are the weak spots to fight with in different battles. And if you, if you reward me at the end, then the reward I want is Jammu and Kashmir, essentially. It's all, it's all written. Maharani had no clue this was going on, right? No clue whatsoever. And, and the crux of the matter is, is there's even courtly records, you know, one of her courtiers at the time, Devana Jubia Prasad, as well as British intelligence files that show that actually she didn't want a war. She wanted to calm things down. She wanted to calm things down and she was trying to, she obviously she was angry and she was grieving and upset that her brother had been killed stone cold in front of her. But she recognized that things had gone too far under him and that she needed to dial things down, right? Uh, but the situation had got way too dangerous and it gets to a point where she actually goes with the little, little Dalip Singh to Gorbin the God Fort to, to take money out of the treasury there and bring it back to pay the soldiers so that they are not banging on her doorstep to kill, essentially to kill her too. And they threaten at that point to kill her because she's left Lahore to um, go to Amritsar. They say, you're doing something, you're trying to run away. And she's like, I'm bloody well trying to get your money. I'm trying to get your money, yeah. Yeah, and they there's all this messes up basically. So that was absolutely fascinating. Let me just put, pull everything back together. So just to clarify, the popular kind of narrative in relation to the Anglo Sikh war that's kind of bounded about is that, um, Marani Jindan essentially couldn't control the army and in a bid to kind of cut it down to size the idea was to send them across the river and obviously they would then just be chopped up but what you're actually saying is that is far from the truth in actual fact she didn't want a war she was trying to calm everything down pay the soldiers and in fact the the kind of the clash of arms or the actual war breaking out is down to the machinations of Raja Gulab Singh. Yeah. So he's pulling the strings. Behind the scenes. Would you say that Raja Gulab Singh is the old, is the main kind of puppet master pulling the strings or or is, or well, everyone else is dead by this point, pretty much. But are there other factions, I guess, within the, the kingdom at that time working for their own means? Well, this is the thing. Punjabi politics, even before Ryan Jidgo was on the scene, even in Raharaja and Singh's times, faction ridden, left, right and centre. So it's, it's in a way, it's, it's slightly, we overregulate when we say Maharaja Ranjit Singh was fully in control of the politics of his kingdom, because there were always factions that were going on and, and people that were approaching the British or chatting up the British, or they were ch being chatted up by the British in order to, to see how, who could, who would bite essentially, right? But, and, and that's, so that's a continuation into the 1840s in some respects. And this is something you know, that I say, well, actually, in, in a way, it counts in the favour of the dynasty into the 1840s. And why we shouldn't say that it was it was destined that they were going to fall. Ranjit Singh's successors were going to fall after his death, because the fact is that they everyone involved, even the British, when Henry Lawrence comes along as the first resident sent by the East India Company to the Basin Hall, everyone keeps that Punjabi monarchy in power. Nobody tries to remove it. And I think that's really significant, a point. They're all trying around it to get hold of this throne. Raja Gulab Singh is one of many players who are using, go, engaging in some of these dirty tactics. But it, it, his, his, his endeavours come at a particular moment where this is, the, this is, I guess, this is some like a broader argument I make in the book, essentially. There's lots of factors that come to align in this particular decade that then leads to the downfall of the Sikh empire. But nothing was inevitable about it, to be quite honest, right? And, and, what goes on in the 1840s is that the East India Company's policy also starts to shift. They start to take over lots more territories in and around the Punjab, right? So they, they nibble away at Ferozpur, they uh, take over Sindh, uh, the, the states of Sindh, just to the kind of west of Punjab. They've, they've just sorted themselves out in Afghanistan, right? But there is this caution, there's wariness. We don't want to take over the whole of Punjab at this point in the company because it's a massive territory and it's unruly right now. So what Harding does is this kind of a pre-partition to what happens in 1947, basically, with his policy. He, it makes a calculated gamble of going to war, but then once the war is over, 
in 1846, in March, he, he makes this peace settlement with Maharani Jindabur's government and he carves up the Punjab kingdom in three sections. They take over the eastern side, the Jalandar Dwarf, they separate off Jammu and Kashmir, give that to Balab Singh, and he's their loyal guy now. And then they leave a rump, one third, with Maharani Jindabur and Balib Singh. And they say to her, you've got to get rid of, whittle down the Khalsa army, get it under control. You've got to pay us a massive war indemnity. And there's a various few other conditions. They were doomed to fail, but they, they was, it was left on their heads, essentially, to deal with it. And if they failed, then it was going to be easier for the company to take over. But, but you're right, in the popular narrative, a lot of this blame is laid on Maharani Jindal's shoulder for the, for the start of the war. And that comes down to one very popular Punjabi poem, Shah Muhammad's Jangnama, essentially. And he, he also, you know, and if you think that was heard in the villages of Punjab, that Maharani as an angry, malicious widow, you know, is upset that her brother was killed and she's, she curses the, the Khalsa. You know, you can see how that would popularize, right? But there's, I, I kind of undid some of the gender politics of that poem and played it up against a few other sources from that period. And so there's only, this is only one account, you know, this is only one account of, of this history. We can't take it as entirely gospel, you see what I mean? Yes, completely. I'm just sat here taking that all in because it, it's like a mini history lesson for me. I absolutely love that. Two questions just off the back of that. And I just want to get your estimation on this, especially considering the research and the understanding that you bring, which is, I guess, for some, the Sikh Empire or the Lahore Darbar is often viewed as kind of the, as in it's the stability of it is viewed as being part and parcel of Ranjit's personality in that once he's dead, everything, it's not it's not that the writing's on the wall, but it's almost as though that there isn't anyone capable of kind of manoeuvring the the the, the bard in the way that Ranjit Singh had and had kept it safe, however you want to define that. In your estimation though, is is that a is that a correct conclusion? Is does that is that kind of reflective of kind of the, the research that you've done and the sources you've seen? Or is that again more of a kind of a popular narrative contrasted against the fact that you then have his wife is who is seen as kind of there's a woman now, she's a failure. Obviously, the man had to have not, had to have been the opposite. Well, you just kind of answered my question there, right? There's so many assumptions that we're making. Yeah. That are deeply gendered, deeply biased. And deeply romanticized, right, about Maharaja Ranjit Singh as this great man versus a weak, feeble woman who doesn't really know what she's doing, right? Now, you have to question that because, you know, I can't believe this is a thing. I, the more I've thought about this over time, the more I've thought, you know, how come we haven't questioned some of this stuff till now, you know? Um, we have set, it's not to take anything away from Maharaja Ranjit Singh before anyone comes at me and saying, oh, anti the Maharaja. I'm not. I think he was a fascinating historical character and he obviously achieved so much. But come on, no one human person can do any of this stuff on their own. Like seriously, you know? So if we just take that as our basic question of he must have had some help. Come on now. <laughs> he wasn't like everywhere at once, sorting every fire out everywhere, right? And conquering and 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 speaking to his subjects and making all the money. No one person can do that. So if we if we just take that idea and just pop it out the window and say, right, let's take a slightly more calm, considered approach to this history. You know, then you've got room for so many other historical characters to come out of the woodworks and to be considered in their own right. And for us to think, how do they operate together? I mean, in recent years, we've had a more of a shift towards thinking about other men still, Hari Singh Nalwa, uh, the Fakir brothers, the Muslim um, courtiers that were very knowledgeable, very prominent in Punjab at this time. Um, you know, even the Divan Muraj of Multan re recalibrating what he did in the in the rebellion uh, by Maharaj Singh, Akali Fullah Singh, all of these characters, what role did they play? You know, and actually, did they agree with Maharaj Ranjit Singh? Did they get on? Did they, was, there, was there kind of an ideological or a power struggle between them? Um, but again, it's still say quite male focused, right? Um, which is, you know, fine. We it's still important to look at these characters. Not a problem. It's not to say that they didn't have a role to play. Then, well, this is the thing, and it's also that 
you know, in the historical record, there are ample instances of various different women doing different activities. So when you start to build that into the picture, that's a new thing. But also then you have to question, so if Ranjit Singh wasn't necessarily the be or the end all, or the pillar that held up the entire Punjab, what does that mean for his heirs and his successors, right? Where does that narrative of him as the great man of Punjab, the Shira of Punjab really come from? And if we unravel some of the construction of that and look at it in a slightly more thoughtful way, you know, he is also a stick. His, that, that image of him is a stick that is used to beat his sons with and his heirs with and that kind of stuff, right? To say, you can never live up to your father's legacy. He was the legend. You are crap. Literally. Sounds like that, every Punjabi household, that though. Well, you know, <laughs> you could see where this problem comes from, right? And 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 to be, and I'm I'm not saying again that his heirs were suddenly people that we should consider as heroes that we've neglected them all this time. They're all still human figures. They all clearly made mistakes to the point where there was power struggles, that there was, you know, assassinations and civil war. That's not a healthy family dynamic but by any means, right? But there are still roles that we see them playing in Ranjit Singh's lifetime. You know, from the age of six, Gorak Singh, his first son, is being sent as a kind of a nominal general on military campaign to conquer forts in his father's name, right? Shir Singh, likewise, his you know, mine again, I show her again, sending sending troops, sending cannons, sending collecting taxes in support of all of these campaigns, educating her son. All of these activities are going on. So clearly the Maharaja is not doing it all by himself. He's supported by this very extensive family network. And the, the whole family is being mobilized from day dot, pretty much, you know. You think about a six-year-old today. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're, they're not going to, off to battle. Well, yeah, but that was the pressure that they were under, right? And to say that they had no clue what they were doing or that they were totally useless and that they had nothing to stand up against compared to their father, it just starts to feel a bit unfair, to be yeah. honest. You know? Well, I think I completely agree, to be honest. I think I was quite, um, just to kind of echo what you're saying, I was quite intrigued when um, I kind of restarted this blog slash podcast and everything that comes with it. I was starting to read about a woman called Sadakor and how she had played an instrumental role in putting putting Rajit Singh essentially on the throne. And I was like, what? And then unraveling it and understanding the politics prior to Rajit Singh even coming anywhere on the scene and how the different missiles were fighting amongst one another and how she is then kind of, he, she's, whether he is using her or she is using him is completely down to the perspective, but they are both working together to get their own kind of um, objectives met, but also she is helping to put him on the throne. Like they walk into, or they march into Amritsar together. She fights just as Singh Ramgadir and deals with him at one point. And I also think that's quite interesting, which is, I don't know about yourself, but I come from a Ramgadir background. And just as Singh Ramgadir is always considered to be like on par, I guess, with Maharaj Ajit Singh, almost viewed as like a, a king before we had a kingdom. Mm -hmm. But then to learn he got his ass handed to him by Sadakor, <laughs> Like let's like let's be real. It puts it, like it just it, it a it blows my mind, but also it it changes the dynamic because I've got two little nieces. One's she's just turned seven, and the other one's just turned five. And so I'm right like I'm racking my brain going through history sometimes, thinking, all right, I need to think, I need to find women that I can go look. These are your these are the type of role models we have in our history. But no one ever hears like you're never like no one's ever told at the good that yeah Sadakord actually handed the dude whose photo you've got up behind you actually got his ass <laughs> handed to him by by Sadakord. That that again just going off on a bit, a bit of a tangent. But coming back to things, what I wanted to pick your brain about was whilst I was reading the book, it, it's it's evident that you spent a lot of time and a lot of care and a lot of research in putting it together. Um, You've also had to dive into different languages like Punjabi and Persian in order to uncover some of the research. I just wanted to ask, what were some of the like interesting snippets of information that came out of some of these other sources, like the Persian sources and the Punjabi sources? Because again, British sources are kind of whipped to death, especially in, 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 in kind of the West. Um, and also the, they're not as accessible, but they're kind of easier or more easy to access. Um, whereas for a lot of people like myself, I have no understanding of Persian. I'd have to go and learn the language first. So what were some of the kind of bits that, that you uncovered from, from some of those kind of sources? So I unfortunately didn't get as far with my Persian studies as I wanted to. I started learning to read in my first year and I was starting to read basic Persian texts. But my tutor left uh, 
like, from Oxford. She left and she went to do her own PhD. I mean, you know, how how rude, you know? <laughs> <laughs> how dare she? <laughs> I know, literally. And uh, there wasn't another tutor for me to work with because I wasn't in the Oriental, this is the annoying thing with academic specialisms, I wasn't in the Oriental Studies programme. I was in the history department. And so I wasn't far enough advanced to go and join the advanced class, but I was more advanced to go than a beginner's class. So I fell through the craps and I was going to do a one-to-one session, but they didn't have a tutor to do it. So I had to stop. So what I did was is I, and I mean, to be honest, it would have been touch and go, even with those rudimentary skills that I would have been able to read manuscripts. And with the funding situation that I described to you earlier, this is where sometimes actually I'll say to people, potentially go to the US to do your studies, if you, especially if you're going to do languages, because you've got built-in support normally, more funding and that kind of stuff, for you to learn languages. They take longer to do their PhDs over there. They can take about seven years, <laughs> which I wasn't going to hang around that long either. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they take you take longer to really learn languages and then go and do your research, essentially. Whereas I was like, I'm going to do it quickly, as quickly as possible, as quickly as a PhD can be done, which is not that quick, but still. So I couldn't afford to essentially take out more time to pay for language tuition, do the language tuition, as well as the PhD. So I took what I learned. Um, I obviously learned to read Punjabi anyway, and I can speak it. Um, and there's lots of Punjabi, Persian sources translated into Punjabi and obviously into English so I looked at those but I also had friends luckily that were a bit better situated with their Farsi studies and were a bit further ahead and so I was like I'll make you some food or something please come with me to the library and and then we'll you know we'll just take loads of photos of these manuscripts and stuff and then can you help me translate them and then I think in my final year I managed to get a bit of extra funding a few hundred pounds uh, from the history department to say look please look we didn't I didn't get lessons but I really there's some of these texts I really need to look at and I need to sit with a specialist in the language to, to translate them so they paid me some money to hire a tutor who was going to sit with me not to teach me but to sit with me and read through this stuff and translate it to me and then we would just have a conversation about the manuscripts and what they were telling us and so, and it was kind of funny, you genuinely did need two heads for this because he was an Iranian speaker, uh, Iranian guy, uh, but from the US, Sabashiani. And he's, I think uh, just in the past year or so, he's finished his PhD on um, on the women of the Shahnameh, the, the amazing um, epic, you know, Persian uh, ancient history, as well as a, as, a, as a piece of fantastic literature. And so he was interested in these very powerful female characters too. Um, so we were working on this together for a few weeks, you know, I, I had snippets of Sohan Lal Suri's original manuscript and a few other other texts oh, wow. from the, the Royal Asiatic Society Library. Because I've got an uh, English version of, of Sohan Lal Suri's Chronicle, but I've only, it, they don't publish the first volume anymore in English because they've, they've redacted it or retracted it, sorry, because of questionable material. I don't know what that is. I'm really sad that that's happened because I'd love, like, as a historian, I'd love to get to grips with it. But um, yeah, I'm fascinated. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, true. I've got from Daftar 2 onwards, all of the copies in English and Punjabi. So obviously they, I've scribbled all over those. I've got a hope. They're behind me on the shelf here. Uh, but I went, there's, there's a copy that was given by Claude Martin Wade. He was a political officer in Punjab at that time. He was, it was given, a gift was given uh, by Ranjit Singh to him of Sohanar's one of one volume of Sohanar's story's history. Yeah. As well as this gardening manuscript. Because who <laughs> knew that Ramaraj yeah. Ranjit Singh was a bit of a gardening nerd. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so was Wade. So they they shared these books, you know, with each other. And and some of those books Wade gifted to the Royal Asiatic Society Library in London. So it just so happens that I found this out, was able with to go with my friend Zara Shah to go and read some of the stuff, take photographs. And then Saba helped me translate it. And then the, why we needed two people was because randomly there'd be some Punjabi words in there and he would he would be sitting there translating and then he'd be like, I can't, I mean, I can't remember what some of the words, but he'd be like, he'd stumble up on a Punjabi word and he'd be reading it out in like an Iranian Farsi accent. Like, I don't know what this is, looking it up in dictionaries. And then I'd be like, wait, 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 say, say that again. And then he'd, he'd sort of spell it out and I'd be like, oh, is this thing, you know, like, is this Punjabi word basically? Because Suri obviously was from Punjab. So he's writing in courtly Persian, but every now and again, he just stuck up a Punjabi word in there because he couldn't be bothered to translate it or whatever. So, so just like, so in the actual manuscript, 
So he's writing in Farsi and then putting Punjabi words in the Farsi alphabet, or is he actually writing? Yeah. The Punj- okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So not as in he's, you know, he's he's, he's just writing it in in Punjabi, uh, Persian letters, right? In that script, but it's a Punjabi word. So every now and again, someone will be like, I don't know, or it would be like his name of a of a person. But he got used to seeing Singh and Gore everywhere. So he was like, oh, it's such and such Singh. And I I, guess I can't read it. And I'd say he'd sound it out and then I'd figure it out from there. So we had a lot of laughs doing that. But it was, yeah, there were lots of things. It was, I mean, it was some of it was just the language, the ways in which um, in Persian courtly language, you know, they're referring to the British or they're referring to the Maharaja, some of the really honorific titles. And I think some of that stuff gets left out in the translation probably because it was so flowery. But the other thing was like, really fascinating stuff like there were horoscopes drawn for um Ranjit Singh for Garak Singh for Noah Nahar Singh and there was one mention for Dalit Singh but it wasn't drawn and that intrigued me because obviously those don't make it into the translations either but in the actual manuscript text there's like pages and pages of these like elaborately drawn horoscopes or gundalis essentially the the birth charts of um the astrological birth charts of these these princes when they're born to kind of understand or determine what their political future or their personal future might be like from from the conditions of the stars at the time of their birth and so it's clearly important you know for this stuff to be included in these texts and nowadays okay yeah you know printers and translators probably don't want to reproduce all this stuff but in in the original copy you have to say well why was this there and so that took me down this rabbit hole of reading about history and astrology and astronomy in Indian political thought of this time. And actually it's so crucial because it gave me an indication of which princes were thought to be legitimate, which sons or grandsons of Ranjit Singh were thought to be legitimate and which were not because only those that were, were thought to be legitimate oh, were wow. deemed important enough to have a horoscope drawn at the time of their birth. So is that where it, that tale of uh there was i can't remember the names there's a set of twins that are uh yeah that one Shea of the Singh wife. yeah so is that why they're yeah. considered not to be legitimate or partly well, there's, la- there's layers to this basically yeah um so shiv singh and dara singh were the, the two sons of ranjit singh's first wife rani metadpur right so he obviously in the book i talk about how he married 30 women Right. And that that was a that was a discovery, journey of discovery in and of itself when I was keeping an Excel spreadsheet of all of these women. But uh, <laughs> And they're just the but, women he married, right? Because he because I was reading uh I can't remember the guy's name, but he's the descendant of the three Fakir brothers. Um yeah. and, and in here one of his book, he he actually he was I was reading it the other day, he was talking about how Ranjit Singh had married a number of women, but then also like most of the kings at the time had a harem, had concubines had all sorts of other women that don't necessarily fit like the wife role but play different roles so i've i've incorporated any name of a woman who had a marriage or as a jadda dagni arrangement so kind of a like a honorary marriage slash potential concubinage in the appendices of my book and i've come come counted up to 30 people but there could well be more to be quite honest there could well be more because the records are a bit patchy and a bit contradictory. But so the first wife, as I mentioned, was Rani Madhabpur. The second wife is mine again. They're the two most powerful early wives, put it that way, that came from, from these leading other missiles, essentially the Ghanaian missile, Sadakur's um, daughter, and Madhabpur is the first one. And then mine again is the second, comes from the Nagai missile. Mine again has a son first, essentially. She has Garakson, which is why she goes up in the pecking order if you see what I mean, of the wives, right? Medhapur then tries to counter this move by producing two sons, okay? Shir Singh and Dara Singh. But it was widely kind of appreciated that Ranjit Singh hadn't been to stay with her or visit her in Badala, in her family estate, for a long time. So this is, again, this idea of Ranjit Singh having a harem is kind of a bit not quite right because these queens were had their own estates as well, right? So only a few women at any one time would have stayed in the killer at Lahore. It wasn't an organized harem in that kind of orientalist fashion in any way, really. And so Medhagor, you know, off her own bat, then it thought that Sadagor encouraged her to just quickly adopt 
two boys, right, from a slave girl. This is the kind of stereotype. This is the kind of popular mythology. But the fact is, is that Suri in his history is quite interesting. And a few, and, and I, it, this is something that circulates into British sources and everywhere as well. He never really acknowledges Shir or Dara. He doesn't mention Dara at all, to be honest. He only mentions Shir Singh because Shir Singh starts to take on a prominent role as a prince and as a soldier and everything else through his lifetime. He never acknowledges them formally as Ranjit Singh's sons. He always ever mentions them at a young age as the grandsons of Sadakur. So Ranjit Singh himself gives them princely titles and gives them money and, and estates and eventually jobs to do, like Gurdjieff Singh was getting. But he is only, they're only really ever referred to as the grandsons of Sadakur. And there's no horoscope for them. Okay. You know? Okay. There's nothing like that for them. That says, well, I think that says quite a lot really in itself, doesn't it? Oh, um, yeah. that's insane. Yeah. I've, that's that's insane. <laughs> I'm, again, I'm just sat here taking it all in and trying to like recalibrate what, what, what's in my head to, to 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 make sense of it. Um, talking about Rani Jindan, the, this there's this kind of dual view of her in like popular history. One is that she's this really weak woman who essentially loses the empire, and then on the other hand, she's kind of viewed as this almost like a Punjabi Boudicca. Like, as in she's viewed like this kind of like battle crazy, war hungry woman um, who is kind of just destined to lose everything, although she's trying her hardest to hold on to it. For everyone listening, how would you define her? Like, what, who, like, who is Rani Jindan in, in the essence of like truly historic, like from what you've read and the, the sources and kind of the, the primary kind of research, like who is she? What, what is actually going on? Well, uh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> well, look, there's another, there's a third, which is the British colonial view that she was, you know, this kind of uh, man eater, right? Essentially, she's having affairs left, right, and centre. Uh, that she's irresponsible, immoral, kind of sexually obsessive, uh, particularly around the story of her and Raja Lal Singh, her, who becomes her prime minister after Jawahar Singh dies. Um, that she was having an affair with him and, 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 and you know, and that bleeds into this, um, the, the first kind of stereotype that you talked about, that she was potentially this woman that threw up, that go, threw over the Punjab, right? That she was weak, she was uh, corrupt and that kind of stuff. Um, and that she not only wanted revenge for her brother's death, but that she was prepared to destroy the Khalsa army in order to achieve that. And that perhaps she was in cahoots with her, cahoots with her lover lasting to make it happen. There is evidence definitely to show that Lal Singh was double dealing as well with the British East India Company. Again, there was another letter that I saw in the in the British Library that shows that he was passing on intelligence to um, Nicholson, one of the leading kind of lieutenant generals of the British Army at the time. Uh, but the thing is, we don't know if she knew. We do not know. So there's no evidence to track it. He takes her name and he says, you may consider us friends, but all of her actions suggests otherwise that she was fighting to hold on to the independence of her son's kingdom not not the other way around this is to go to your question then who was the maharani there's there's a there's an approach that i take with the book and with my work on this kind of stuff that i i am not the person to answer that question i cannot answer that question really you know and i think it's interesting that we look to our historians to do that for us when really now no one can answer that question, right? Because those people are long gone, you know? Only they can tell us who they are, really, you know? And my job is, the way I see, have come to see it over time, is to try and bring to light as much of that person's truth as I can, but nevertheless, it's always gonna be, you know, my approach to that, to trying to shine a light on that, is always gonna be colored by my bias, by my ability to get as much of the evidence as possible to extract it from wherever, that's always going to be a slightly unsuccessful attempt. I can't get to everything. And there will always be new things that come to light or new ways in which we interpret people's stories, right? So it's something that I'm thinking about now, again, because my next book project, I'm trying to look at Maharaja Dalip Singh's story and his journey and his politics. And I mean, he's got even more contradictory, you know, views that we have amongst him in the community, right? He's a whole, he's a whole messed up story. And, but we, we, biography is quite a, 
an important genre in our history writing, right? As well as these lavish courtly chronicles that are quite um, almost mythologizing about our kings and our gurus and our history and that kind of stuff, right? And actually, now, especially today, as much as we want to uncover these characters and look at them in a new light and really understand who they were, I think we still have to bear in mind that we have to do that with a pinch of salt. We're never going to 100% know. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't bother. I'm absolutely saying that's not the way to look at it. We definitely should, we should still bother. We should still be interested. We should still ask questions. But we have to accept that there's certain things we're never going to fully know. You know, was, was Mah the Maharani a bit of a madam or was she actually this amazing queen? I think maybe, the, the honest, my honest feeling is, there might have been a bit of both going on. It could well have been that she really had a, some sort of relationship with Raja Lal Singh. And it is also the case that she had to deal with all kinds of crap from the likes of Raja Lal Singh, from the British, and that she was a human, flawed person who, in that situation, anyone would be put under pressure and would make mistakes. But that she made some very bold moves and that she was an incredibly brave person for what she tried to achieve in, in her small lifetime, particularly, you know, the way that she just never gave up on that struggle to keep the Punjab independent, to keep her son's kingdom independent. I think it's incredible what she tried to do when she was locked up in Shekhapura Fort, plotting a rebellion from there. Then she gets kicked out of Punjab, sent down to Janab near Benares. She manages to escape from this high security fort on the top of a cliff. I mean, it's just insane. Dresses up as a seamstress and then treks it all the way to Nepal, thousands of miles, and then tries to fight for another day from there. I mean, if that's not incredible, then I don't know what is, quite honestly. But if you were to say to me, define her character, I can't, can I? I can't define hers, I can't define yours. I'm just trying to figure out what mine is. Do <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? No, no, so I appreciate I think that. If we shared some of those expectations and just try and engage with the humanness of this history, I think we gain so much more from that. And also we can we can forgive ourselves for our humanness a bit more as well, right? And not strive to be perfect all the time. I think that's the lesson that is, is actually quite hopefully helpful out of all this history stuff. No, 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 definitely. I've absolutely loved to. If if we didn't have the time constraint, I'd be sat here for hours and hours and hours and we 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 would continue. The last question that I just want to check is what can we expect from you in this year? Like is there any or like is there anything that we could see coming in the next kind of 11 12 months or is it just kind of oh, you can't say anything no, and you have to watch and wait? No, no, nothing happens that fast. Um, <laughs> I wish I wish I could knock books out that fast. It would be so much easier if I could, you know. Well, like in Harry Potter, where that Albus Dumbledore does that as what is it? Uh, he takes the thought out of it. Oh yeah, and, and he puts it. In, oh, something. that would be cool. Yeah. Imagine, imagine you could and then just, just like... imagine, you know, just make it into a book from there. Uh, no, I think this year is a year of research, going back to the back to the archives, researching, um, starting to develop a new project proposals, hopefully getting a contract, hopefully getting some funding again. I, I forgot how long this part takes, you know, it's so it's so it's quite sad and funny and depressing and everything at the same time. Uh, so I'm getting back onto that. I am working, there will be some events that you can look out for. I'll definitely be doing more of this podcast talks, um, you know, probably potentially popping up in a few TV or radio appearances here and there. Um, and I will be giving talks about my new research. And I, I hope, you know, people will be able to join me and come along for that because this is my test phase right where I'd start doing new research and then I test it out in different talks and events um so I'm working in partnership I'm funded a little bit by Oxford part-time at the moment I am working for them part-time as a community history fellow setting up a new history uh, project in the local community in Oxford so if anyone wants to work on that side of thing get in touch but I'm also working as a knowledge exchange fellow with funded by Oxford with the museum that was set up by Dilip Singh's second son, Prince Frederick. The one in, in Thetford. Thetford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's called the Ancient House Museum. And they are, in the next couple of years, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the setup of that museum. And they really want to do a lot more work on promoting the Dilip Singh family legacy and understanding it more carefully. So I'm researching with them. And we will be doing some events and things like that. And we would love for the community to get involved. So please, 
don't expect a book from me. Come and join me. Come and help me do this research. <laughs> and then eventually there'll be a book down the line. Hopefully, fingers crossed. That is brilliant. Yeah. Just for those then that are interested to find out more or wanted to get in contact with you, where can they find you? Where should they be like, where should they look or like, what are your socials and that kind of thing? Um, so I'm on Instagram. Uh, what's my Instagram? Dr. Priya Atwal. Uh, Twitter is at Priya Atwal. And you can look me up. I have got for media stuff. You've got to speak to my agent, sorry. Uh, but for just general project research questions, that kind of thing, um, just Google my Oxford uh, page, my profile page. So just, you know, Priya Atwal Oxford. And then my email address will pop up. So you can write to me there and uh, send me any questions. I won't keep you any longer, but just to Thank wrap up, I just want to say, I have enjoyed today so much. I am actually really glad that we get to do a part two because like I'd kind of, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that sad that it's ended if that makes sense. Cause I know there's okay. more. Um, I can't say thank you enough for, for taking the time out and also just for doing the work that you've gone and done and then sharing it and publishing the book and everything else that's come with it. I'm uh, like, I'm genuinely eternally grateful for, for, for that because I think I th kind of echoing what you were saying earlier, we can't necessarily define these historical figures kind of to a dot or to a T, but we can certainly understand them as best as we can and kind of, and how they relate to us as human beings. So yeah, I just, thank you so much. Thank um, you. No, I hope so you, in, no, no, it's not a problem. I hope you enjoy your uh, show tonight as well. Um, it, it should the be absolutely brilliant. comedy show, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, it will be brilliant. I really do hope you enjoy it. But otherwise than that, I won't keep you any longer. I will let you Thank get you. on with your evening um, and I will good. talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Will you take good care of yourself, all right? Not and a I'll, I will catch up for part two. Yes, definitely. I'll go Thank have you. a, I was like, I'll, have, I'll make sure I have fully rested, ready <laughs> for, you know, vocal cords primed ready to go for that one but yeah this is so Definitely. much fun today no and, thank uh, you yeah we'll do something again soon okay brilliant i'm glad you enjoyed it we'll talk soon take care take care bye, bye. bye, -bye. So you made it to the end of another video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know the bit you enjoyed the most in the comments below and feel free to leave any questions you have for Priya as I'm planning to do another podcast with her in the near future. Other than that, please make sure to like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next one.